Okay, so today we're going to be going over hepatitis, and it's going to be hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. Um, there's some little tricks and tips that I have for you along the way to kind of help you remember the things that you need to know for hepatitis. Overall, it's really not that difficult of a topic for the pants. Um, the serology is for hepatitis B is a little bit more of a tricky area, but overall not too difficult. But I'll give you some ways to remember the important things that you need to know. So let's start first because there's a lot in common with all of the hepatitis viruses. So let's just go over a few things that you need to know for all of them. So hepatitis um, and all types of hepatitis, the history and exam is going to be pretty similar. So I'm going to kind of run through each one as we go through them. But you should know that in all of them, you're going to have these nonspecific kind of constitutional symptoms, whether it's malaise, fever, nausea, vomiting, um, on exam, jaundice, hepatomegaly, right upper quadrant tenderness, clay-colored stools. This is all due to the breakdown of the red blood cells, bilirubin, excess in the body. Um, and all these things you're going to see in all of the hepatitis. So they can't really ask you a question based off of just the history and exam because it could be any of the hepatitis. This is all going to be in common in all of these. So something you should know. And then as far as the diagnosis, while each one has a specific antibody that you're testing for, the LFTs, the, the liver function tests like the AST, the AOT, the bilirubin, they're normally all going to be elevated in all of them. So again, you see increased LFTs. It's not going to tell you, oh, this is... Uh, hepatitis A or B or C, it's it's nonspecific and it can be elevated in all of them. So those are some things that you're going to see in common for all of the hepatitis. Um, and I just want to clear that up before we get started into the specific ones. And then one other topic that I wanted you, or one other term that I wanted you to know, because I'm going to mention it a few times, is something known as fulminant hepatitis. And this is going to be acute hepatic failure in patients with hepatitis. And this is when the liver is failing within a matter of days or weeks. And most of the time, the only definitive treatment is going to be a liver transplant. So I'll be going over that as well. I just wanted you to be familiar with that term when we do go into it, because some of these hepatitis viruses can develop into fulminant hepatitis. So let's get started with first hepatitis A. So hepatitis A is a viral infection of the liver, like all of the hepatitis viruses. Um, as far as transmission, the main thing that you need to know for hepatitis A is going to be fecal oral transmission. That's the big one. That's the one that you really need to know for hepatitis A. And it's going to be whether it's via person-to-person -person contact, contaminated food or water, daycare workers due to changing diapers and things like that. Um, you do need to know that's the most common transmission of hepatitis A. Now, how do you remember that? Well, I remember hepatitis A stands for hepatitis anus. Makes you think of like the fecal <laughs> route. So uh, most common mode, uh, fecal oral route. Think of hepatitis A, hepatitis anus. That's how I remember hepatitis A for that. Um, so again, the things I went over, contaminated food or water, daycare workers, um, international travel as well. Um, and in developing countries that have poor sanitation, there's almost a 100% infection rate in children under nine with hepatitis A. So if you travel internationally to an area that has poor sanitation, you may be exposed. And then the, the people that live in these countries, it's almost a 100% infection rate in children of hepatitis A, the ones that have poor sanitation. So it's also important to know for hepatitis A. Now, in history and exam, again, what I went over before, you're going to see similarities in all of these, but symptoms are typically mild. Many patients can be asymptomatic. They do develop symptoms. Again, it's going to be like fever, nausea, vomiting, general malaise. So nothing specific that you need to know that's going to say, okay, this is hepatitis A. So don't go crazy on the history exam with um, any of the hepatitis viruses because they're very nonspecific. Again, hepatomegaly, jaundice, right upper quadrant tenderness is going to be seen in all of these. Now, as far as the diagnosis, here, of course, you're going to see your increased LFTs, AST, L ALT, bilirubin. And when you do take labs for patients with hepatitis, if they they have an acute infection, a lot of times the AST and the ALT will be in the thousands, sometimes up to 10,000. So that's important to know because sometimes you'll see an AST that's like 75 and the patients will say, oh, do I have hepatitis? Well, no. If you have an acute infection, it's going to be in the thousands. Chronic infection with hepatitis sometimes can be like in the hundreds, like maybe three, 400 the AST and the ALT. Um, so again, this is what you're going to see in all of the hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. You'll see those increased LFTs, liver function tests. Now, what's specific to hepatitis A is something known as the IgG, or I'm sorry, the IgM anti-HAV. So that's going to be your acute, your acute infection, and this will be a test. Um, you can also do one known as the IgG, which is going to show the, uh, the chronic infection or a past infection. And once we get to the hepatitis B serology, so I'm going to go over some ways to remember the IgG, IgM, and different tests. But when you're thinking of hepatitis A, and as far as diagnosis, the most specific and sensitive is going to be the IgM anti-HAV 
testing for your acute infection. And then of course the IgG anti-HAV, that's gonna be your chronic infection. So that's the way you're gonna diagnose for hepatitis. As far as treatment, most of the time it's gonna be supportive. It's gonna be rest, acetaminophen fluids. Um, you should also know that there is a hepatitis A vaccine as well as immunoglobulin avail available for prevention and post-exposure prophylaxis. In most cases, if you do have a patient and you're trying to um, prevent them from getting hepatitis A because they've been exposed, most of the time you're gonna use the hepatitis A vaccine um, unless the patient is immunocompromised, has pre-existing chronic liver disease, then you give both the hepatitis A vaccine and the immunoglobulin. And then of course the hepatitis A vaccine is part of most of the vaccination um, schedules for children here in the States and as well as other countries as well. Now, the things that you need to know for hepatitis A, you really need to know that it's fecal oral transmission. That's going to be your most common. You need to know that the diagnosis is with the IgM or IgG anti-HAV. And then you need to know that it's very rare for it to ever progress to chronic or fulminant hepatitis. And another way that I remember that is hepatitis A also stands for hepatitis acute because it's almost never chronic. It's extremely, extremely rare. It's almost only just an acute infection. So you should know that as well. So those are the three things that I really think you need to know for hepatitis A. Now, let's move on to something a little bit more complicated. Um, that's hepatitis B. So there's a little bit more to know with this. So hepatitis B, again, is a viral infection of the liver. But hepatitis B can cause both acute and then there's a higher prevalence of chronic infections, sometimes up to about 5%. Um, fulminant hepatitis is pretty rare with hepatitis B, really only 0.1 to 0.5%. So pretty rare with this. And then, like I said, uh, chronic hepatitis can be seen in around 5% of patients. So more than hepatitis A, but still not very common, as we'll see later on in like hepatitis C, where it's extremely common. Um, as far as transmission with hepatitis B, there's really two ways that you really need to know. Um, and that's going to be um, in areas where there is high prevalence. So hepatitis B is pretty common in countries that don't vaccinate for it. Uh, the most common mode of transmission is going to be what's known as vertical transmission or perinatal. And that's a pregnant mother passing it along to the, the baby, to the newborn baby. So that's high prevalence areas. That's going to be the most common mode of transmission. And in low prevalence regions like the U.S., most common mode of transmission is going to be bodily fluid. So sexual intercourse, IV drug use. And the way that I remember that is that I remember hepatitis B stands for baby and bodily fluids. So again, baby is going to be your perinatal or vertical transmission, mother to baby. And then the other B stands for bodily fluids. So that's going to be IV drug use, sexual intercourse. Um, it's going to be your bodily fluids in the, in the low prevalence area. So that's what the B stands for in hepatitis B. That's the way I remember it. And then moving on to history and exam. Again, I'm just going to kind of breeze through this. Um, you may have patients known as the ictric phase. This is going to be the patients with jaundice. So about 30% will have jaundice. 70% will not have jaundice. So subclinical or anictric phase. So no jaundice. And then, of course, fever, nausea, vomiting, malaise. Again, just think about it in a vignette. They say a patient has jaundice. Is that going to tell you this is hepatitis B? No. So it doesn't really matter. Again, history and exam isn't very high yield for hepatitis now, moving on to diagnosis, this is where it starts to get a little bit more complicated. And this is about as hard as hepatitis gets for the pan. So you do need to know a few things with the serology. I'm going to give you a little bit of a warning. Um, you could spend a lot of time knowing all of the serology and memorizing it. By your NPA school, you have way more important things that you need to learn for the maybe one question you'll get on the pants or on your exams. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to explain a pretty easy way I found to remember a few things you need to know for the serologies. This isn't all inclusive, but this gives you enough that you'll probably get the question right that you're going to get on, on the pants or your exams. This helped me enough that I was able to get the couple questions right. But again, do not waste a lot of time on this. I would spend, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes learning the basic serologies that I'm going to teach you. And that's it. Don't spend any more time on this. So I think there's four things that you really need to know to get the questions right that you're most likely going to be asked on the pants. So what are the four things you need to know? First, you need to know the difference between IgG and IgM. This is going to be under what's known as the anti-HBC serology. So it's going to tell you whether they're positive for IgG antibodies, IgM, or it's going to say there's nothing under here. This, there was nothing that tested positive. So how do you know the difference between IgG and IgM? Well, first, IgG indicates a chronic infection. So how can you remember that? The way I remember it is IgG, the G in IgG stands for gone meaning the acute infection is gone and now it's in the chronic stage. So IgG, chronic infection, remember gone, and acute infection is gone, now it's in the chronic stage. 
Now, IgM, this indicates an acute infection. So how do I remember that? IgM, you've only had the infection for a minute. It's acute. You've only had it for a short period of time. So you see IgM, think I've only had the infection for a minute, and you know that IgM means it's an acute infection. So IgG, IgM, IgG is acute, IgM is going to, I'm sorry, IgG is chronic, IgM is acute. So that's the way I remember. Those are the first two things that you need to remember. There's only two other things you need to know, I feel like, for the serologies. So the three and four, the ones that you need to know. You have hepatitis B surface antibodies, so B, also known as anti-HBS, and then you have hepatitis B surface antigens, HBSAG, so antibodies, antigens. So what do you need to know about these two? Well, hepatitis B surface antibody, you need to know that that B stands for two things. The hepatitis B surface antibody, the B stands for both booster, meaning your hepatitis B booster or your vaccine. And then the other B stands for beat it. Like you beat hepatitis B, it's resolved. You kicked the infection out of your body, it's gone. So B, hepatitis B surface antibodies. If you see a positive, you should be thinking of booster. They got the hepatitis B booster vaccine, however you want to say it, um, or beat it. They beat hepatitis B, it's resolved. Now, hepatitis B surface antigen has a G. So surface antigen, what does the G stand for? It means got it. They got hepatitis B. You just have to decide whether it's acute or chronic, which will look at our IgG and IgM. So you see hepatitis B surface antigen positive. You should be thinking this patient got it. They have hepatitis B. Now I just need to figure out, is it acute or chronic? You see a hepatitis B surface antibody. You should be thinking either booster, they got the vaccine, or beat it. They beat hepatitis B. It's resolved. Now, quick review. IgG stands for gone, chronic infection. The acute infection is gone. IgM, they've only had the infection for a minute. It's an acute infection. Hepatitis B surface antibody, either booster or beat it. And then uh, finally, hepatitis B surface antigen. They got it. They have hepatitis B. Is it acute or chronic? Now, let's go through a few examples. Again, I don't want to waste too much time on this, but I think you, you know these basic concepts. You can get the question right. So if a patient presents, on, and then on the H, hepatitis B serologies, they are only positive for hepatitis B surface antibody. So you see hepatitis B surface antibody, what should you be thinking? Should be thinking either booster or beat it. So they either got the vaccine or they beat hepatitis B and it's in the resolved um, state. Now, how do you know the difference? Well, if only the surface antibody is positive, only the hepatitis B surface antibody is positive, they got the booster. If the surface antibody is positive plus IgG is positive, that means they beat it. So IgG, and the hepatitis B surface antibody, they beat it. It's a resolved infection. If only the surface antibody is positive, they got the booster. They got the hepatitis B vaccine. So that's how you decide with that one. Now, what if the surface antigen is positive? So hepatitis B surface antigen is positive. You should be thinking um, they got it. They have hepatitis B. Now, is it chronic or acute? Now, how do we know if it's acute or chronic? We look at our IgG and IgM. So they got it, it's acute or chronic. Now, if the IgG is positive, remember it's gone, it's chronic. If the IgM is positive, they've only had it for a minute, it's acute. So those are really the four things that you need to know for it. And you'll get most of the questions right. Really, the only thing that I'm not going over is there's a couple other envelope antigens and antibodies that go into the uh, the chronicity and whether or not it's replicating or non-replicative. I've never seen those questions asked. That's going way too in depth, and I wouldn't worry about that part. This is really, I feel like, all you need to know, and you're really not missing much. So if you know, if you remember those four things: IgG, IgM, surface antibodies, surface antigens, and remember the ways that I tell you to go to remember them, I think you'll be good and you'll be able to get the question right. So that's as hard as it gets for hepatitis. Let's go over the other basic stuff. Treatment for acute hepatitis B, it's really just supportive. And then as far as chronic, it's going to be antiviral agents. Those are a few of the antiviral agents you may see. Again, don't really worry too much about the, the specific antiviral agents. They're not going to ask you to choose one over the other one. They're just going to ask you, you know, are you going to use, you'll have a list of these as well as some other, you know, maybe like antibiotics that are completely unrelated. Um, and you just need to pick one of the antivirals. So that's about all you need to know as far as treatment. Um, you also need to know, of course, there is the hepatitis B um, vaccine. And, it, you know, that's given at, at birth, um, again, at one to two months, and then again at about six months. So that's really all else you need to know for hepatitis B. Now, what are your need to knows for hepatitis B? You need to know that the main mode of transmission is either baby or bodily fluids. So either perinatal or intercourse or IV drug use. 
You need to know your basic serologies, which I can't write out in one sentence there, but we just went over that. Again, don't go crazy with this, but just know those basics. And then you need to know that treatment is supportive and acute and antivirals are chronic. So that's pretty much it for hepatitis B. Hopefully I didn't overwhelm you too much with the serologies. Again, it becomes much easier from, from here on out. So let's move on to hepatitis C. This is a little bit more simple. Um, so the main things you need to know with hepatitis C, the overall, the most important thing that you need to know is that hepatitis C is almost always going to progress to chronic. About 85% of patients are going to progress to the chronic stages of hepatitis C. How do you remember that? Very simply by thinking hepatitis C, the C stands for chronic. So up to 85% of cases progress to chronic infection. Now, you also need to know that up to 30% of patients with hepatitis C are actually going to develop cirrhosis in a 20 to 30 year period. And that in the U.S., hepatitis C is the most common cause of chronic liver disease. It's the most common reason a patient in the U.S. is going to need a liver transplant. So a lot of comorbidities with hepatitis C that you do need to know as well, all related to the fact that it does progress to chronic stages um, so frequently. Now, as far as transmission, there's really only one way that you need to know um, in developed countries like the U.S., most common mode of transmission is going to be through percutaneous exposure to infected blood. So IV drug users, that's by far and away going to be your most common mode of transmission here in the United States and your most common mode of transmission overall. So hepatitis C, just remember IV drug users and you should be good. Now, hep, um, intercourse and perinatal transmission, like we saw in hepatitis um, B and hepatitis A as well, um, really not a common cause that's seen in hepatitis C. So really should just focus on your IV drug users. Um, as far as clinical manifestations, again, a lot of overlap here. Let's just breathe through this. Most patients asymptomatic, they may develop malaise, anorexia, myalgia, um, jaundice, clay colored stools, and dark urine as well. So again, nothing really specific there. Now diagnosis, there's a couple things that you need to know. Of course, remember on all of these, I don't mention increased LFTs, but again, all hepatitis viruses, increased LFTs are going to be um, common with all of these. But for hepatitis C, you have a couple different ways to, um, to diagnose. So the way you screen, you suspect a patient has hepatitis C, um, you're going to use a screening test, which is known as an HCV antibody. Um, this is going to be um, positive in patients with either a current infection, whether it's acute or chronic, or even a past resolved infection. So it's not really specific, but that's why it's your screening test. So this is the first thing that you're gonna do. Now, if you screen and it is positive, you wanna have a, uh, a confirmation, and you're gonna do that with your HCV RNA test. This is a PCR test, so a polymerase chain reaction test, and it's more sensitive than the HCV antibodies and more specific, really. Um, so this, this is gonna indicate that a patient has an acute infection, um, and it's also going to, um, basically rule out if the, if this test is negative you can essentially rule out active um hepatitis um c infection and i'm sorry i said acute but it also can be it could be acute or chronic um when you have a confirmatory hcv rna test so you're going to screen with the hcv antibodies and you're going to confirm with uh hepatitis c rna test so that's going to be your more specific test between the two now as far as treatment uh, the most important thing you need to know here is that with antivirals, you can have up to a 95% cure rate. Again, don't go crazy with the specific agents. There's a few. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the names, but these are a couple of the, the combinations that they use. And these are the newer antiviral agents. And in the newer ones, again, up to about a 95% cure rate for hepatitis C. So you just need to know that, that you will use antivirals and you can cure almost all patients with hepatitis C with the newer antiviral agents, where, which again are extremely um expensive um, but they are out there if you can get it covered for a patient so now what do you need to know uh number one is by far your most important you need to know that up to 85 percent of patients will progress to chronic stages iv drug use is going to be the most common cause in the u.s um, hcv antibodies to screen hcv rna test for confirmation and newer newer antivirals have to have up to a 95 percent cure rate so that's really all you need to know for hepatitis c now let's move on to the last two that are much um, more simple. There's not a lot to know for hepatitis D and E, just a few things that you really need to know for both. So hepatitis B or hepatitis D, I'm sorry, most important thing that you need to know for hepatitis D is that it cannot exist without hepatitis B. It's a defective virus that is dependent on a co-infection with hepatitis B. So that's really important for you to know. The way I remember that is hepatitis D stands for dependent because hepatitis D virus is dependent on a co-infection with hepatitis 
B. So hepatitis D is dependent on hepatitis B to exist. So that's really the most important thing. If you forget everything else, don't forget that. Um, as far as transmission, it's mostly exposure to infected blood, infected blood. So IV drug users are at a high risk. Um, clinical manifestations, again, here we go. Uh, meaning asymptomatic, those are symptoms, jaundice, clay colored stool, myalgia, nausea, etc. So diagnosis for hepatitis D, you're going to use the anti-HDV antibody for your screening, and then you're gonna confirm with another RNA test, and that's gonna be your HDV RNA. So diagnose with your screening anti-HDV um, antibody, and then your HDV RNA is gonna be your confirmatory test. Um, treatment, if they're asymptomatic, normal ALT levels, like you have a normal liver function test, you're really just gonna observe. If they become symptomatic or they develop some abnormal ALT levels, in particular is the ones that you look at for hepatitis D, you're going to give them interferon alpha is going to be the most commonly used antiviral. So remember, hepatitis D specific, this is really the only one that I would say if you're going to remember a specific agent, remember for hepatitis D, interferon alpha is the most commonly used antiviral. Um, as far as pre prevention, how do you think you prevent hepatitis D? I'll give you a second to think about it. You give them hepatitis B vaccine. So if they can't, if they don't get hepatitis B, they can't get hepatitis D. So that's how you prevent. What are the things you need to know? You absolutely need to know the. Um, you need a co-infection with hepatitis B for hepatitis D to exist. Um, you want to know that your treatment is going to be most commonly with interferon alpha, and then you need to know that you prevent hepatitis D with a hepatitis B vaccine. That's really all you need to know for hepatitis D. Let's go to the easiest of all of them, hepatitis E. So hepatitis E, the most important thing you need to know with hepatitis E, that generally it's similar to hepatitis A, um, and it's normally self-resolving. Most patients are going to have mild symptoms unless, and this is the key, the thing that you need to know, the patient is pregnant. Then the, the chance of fulminant hepatitis goes up dramatically, and there's a really high mortality rate, about a 25% mortality rate in pregnant patients. So you need to know hepatitis E is normally... Um, self-resolving patients are going to get better no issues with this unless they're pregnant and how do you remember that um, the way I remember that is hepatitis E and I should have had a little card here but I guess I didn't hepatitis E stands for embryo so when I think of embryo I think of pregnancy so you remember that kind of triggers that pregnancy is much more dangerous when you have this type of hepatitis so hepatitis E embryo pregnancy 25% mortality rate as far as transmission fecal oral route like in hepatitis A, and then clinical manifestations. Uh, what do you think is gonna happen here? Uh, most patients asymptomatic, nausea, vomiting, jaundice, abdominal pain. <coughs> so again, tons of overlap here with hepatitis. As far as diagnosis, anti-HEV IgM is going to be the way you're going to diagnose the acute infection. And then treatment is going to be supportive unless the patient is pregnant. And then obviously this is a whole different realm of severity and there's gonna be a lot of other treatment methods that you're going to have to focus on here. And unfortunately, if it does develop into fulminant hepatitis, again, like we went over, liver transplant a lot of times is the only um, curative route for this. So remember hepatitis E, hepatitis embryo, pregnancy, very dangerous. Otherwise, this is pretty straightforward, similar to hepatitis A. So, and then here we go. I guess I got it later on. So hepatitis E, embryo, 25% mortality rate during pregnancy. Um, so that is hepatitis. I just did a kind of all of the little ways to remember here all in one card. So hepatitis A, remember anus, most common mode of transmission, fecal oral route. Hepatitis B stands for baby and bodily fluids. So perinatal transmission, <clears throat> bodily fluids, IV drug use, sexual intercourse. Hepatitis C, remember chronic up to 85% of cases. D stands for dependent because it's dependent on co-infection with hepatitis B. And then finally, hepatitis E stands for embryo. So 25% mortality rate during pregnancy, otherwise generally self-limited. That is hepatitis. I hope that was not too overwhelming. I know those hepatitis B serologies can kind of be a pain sometimes, but I hope that helped you. And as always, thank you so much for watching my videos. I appreciate all the comments and the likes. And um, I would appreciate it if you, you didn't mind just leaving a review comment on this video or the other ones you've been enjoying trying to get the word out about the videos and if you like the videos as well i always mention that i do have a podcast as well under cram the pants so thank you so much as always good luck on your pants your pantry your eors and good luck in pa school